Next, we take you to Wordsworth Books in Little Rock. You'll hear from journalist and author Gene Lyons. His new book is titled Fools for Scandal, How the Media Invented Whitewater. Shall we, shall we start? Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody here, uh, uh, and I'm gratified and pleased that there actually are more people here that aren't related to me than are. And uh, there are quite a few people I don't even know, and, and a few that don't owe me money, so it's nice to see such a nice turnout. I'm very flattered and, and pleased by it. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to handle this. I, I, uh, what I'd like to do is read um, briefly, I hope, uh, from uh, Fools for Scandal, and then possibly open the floor to take some questions about what the book's like and um, maybe why I wrote what I did. I would briefly characterize the book as, um, uh, I guess I'd have to call it the Emperor's New Clothes version of the, white, the Whitewater scandal. Um, it's, this has been, watching this thing happen as a, a journalist and writer who has lived in Arkansas for about, what, 20, we moved here in 1972. We moved, we moved here in 1972. My wife's a native, and we've lived here ever since. And I've been a, a, a journalist and writer most of the last, I guess ever since 1976, I've done it full-time um, for money, uh, have not worked much in Arkansas, uh, mostly worked for magazines outside the state. Uh, over a long period of time and have not actually written all that much about Arkansas until uh, I gave up uh, working for Newsweek some years ago to write Widow's Web and, and I've since written a fair amount about the state of Arkansas and the people in it. But uh, I've never covered the government. I, but what I'm about to say is that I have never in my uh, career as a journalist uh, and writer ever seen anything like uh, this experience of living through uh, this uh, whitewater uh, situation at, at ground level and uh, that's what amazed me that's what continues to amaze me and um, I hope that readers will find that this is not their grandfather's uh, whitewater book it's uh, cheeky uh, by definition and it's smart alecky and it's kind of a raz uh, to an awful lot of people who I think have been um, uh, flummoxed, swindled, fooled, and taken for a ride, uh, just like the townsfolk that the king and the duke fooled in uh, Huckleberry Finn on the Arkansas shore of the Mississippi in uh, whenever it was, sometime in uh, the mid-19th century. Uh, and I thought that one thing I would like to do would be to is narrate as much as I can of the story of one lone whitewater witness, the only witness that um, I can think of whose uh, testimony at the whitewater hearings was um, directly contradicted by several FBI agents and U.S. attorneys who told uh, a couple of patently unbelievable stories that no grown-up would uh, believe, but which every single member of the Washington Press Corps that I'm familiar with pretended to believe. Um, uh, which turned out indeed to be false, who, um, when confronted with hard questions that she couldn't answer, fainted dead away, uh, <laughs> seriously, and, and never returned. Now, I'm going to leave you guessing about the identity of this witness because you'd never know it by reading the national press. And uh, before I get into telling the saga of this remarkable person and her adventures in Whitewater, I'd like to set the tone a bit by reading what I regard as, as the quintessential Whitewater paragraph, which appeared in um, Time magazine in January 1994, just when the entire Washington Press Corps was ginning itself up into this uh, wild uh, feeding frenzy is the term that's often used, but it seems not quite enough to me. There's this sort of giddy feeling of excitement and anticipation that we're going to bring one down. You know? 
I want to read this paragraph to you because it still astonishes me. It was left to Time magazine to reduce the matter to its essence. Where did Whitewater fit? Columnist Michael Kramer wondered among the, quote, jumble of disturbing impressions, end quote, of President Clinton. He summarized the media's suspicions in what may be the quintessential Whitewater paragraph. Let's count the maybes, shall we? Whitewater, Kramer opined, is, quote, different, or could be, because the wrongdoing, if there was any, may have involved abuses of power while Clinton was serving as governor of Arkansas. On the other hand, Whitewater, too, is from the past, so even if the worst were approved, and no one yet knows what that is, the offense might not warrant impeachment. <laughs> then came the clincher. How is it possible, Kramer wanted to know, that two respected lawyers like Bill and Hillary Clinton didn't possess a paper trail capable of proving their innocence? <laughs> And I go on to add, had Time's resident inquisitor plagiarized Kafka's The Trial or Orwell's 1984? No. Here is an American political journalist ostensibly at the top of his game, demanding with absolute solemnity that the President of the United States and his wife prove themselves innocent of charges he could not himself define. <laughs> and what the rest of the media had decided was this. By failing to roll over and expose their throats and underbellies, the Clintons were, quote, acting guilty. They had committed the unpardonable sin of allowing their disdain for the press to show in the most public possible way. And for that, they would pay and pay. Now, I'd like to move on to the character in question. This is, uh, I've, I've, then, I've then summarized actually what I think, judging by all the public documents that are available, the Clintons actually knew about the fate of their Whitewater investment in uh, January of 1994, which was a lot less than we know now, uh, simply because mm -hmm. they only knew what was in the very chaotic books of the Whitewater Development Corporation, which was only one of a dozen uh, real estate companies that Jim McDougall was running money through at that period. And lacking subpoena power, they had uh, probably less of an idea of what he was up to than the <coughs> Washington Post. So. I make a case that it actually was not, uh, it was actually fairly sensible of them to try to get the Justice Department to do a real investigation rather than have the press do one of its jobs. Uh, now, uh, so I leave it at that. And I say that, you know, uh, the fact that uh, stonewalling the press in 1994 was bad politics or uh, didn't, didn't work out too smoothly doesn't make it the wrong decision. Things could very easily, all things considered, have been far worse. Meanwhile, the real whitewater craziness was taking place in Kansas City. By early 1994, the regional office of the Resolution Trust Corporation had begun to resemble bureaucratic warfare at its deadliest. Actually, I try to joke with that. I, I, um, I described it as Monty Python's The Federal Investigation, but um, <laughs> my, my editor was afraid that nobody would get it, so we, <laughs> so we let it out. Uh, the agency's normal operations appear to have ground to a halt as colleagues investigated and spied upon one another. Charges and countercharges zipped back and forth by fax and email. Accusations of, poli accusations of political bias, purge, and cover-up filled the air. The proximate cause of all the trouble was a previously insignificant RTC investigator of decidedly conservative views named L. Jean Lewis, who had taken it upon herself to topple the President of the United States. An FBI agent who dealt with her during this period would later testify that she'd made dramatic pronouncements to him about altering the course of history. Lewis's bureaucratic enemies alleged that a book was in the works, but Lewis later denied this under oath. Alas, one big problem with this grand scenario was that Lewis, on evidence, was barely competent to do her job. She was neither a lawyer nor a CPA. She'd had no meaningful law enforcement experience. What she did have was a zealot's rashness and inability to comprehend facts at odds with her preconceived ideas and an amazingly selective memory. Lewis was also dogged and cunning. She soon had reporters and eager Republicans eating out of her hand. In essence, Lewis's job at the RTC was that of a glorified bank teller to sift through records of failed SNLs looking for signs of fishy transactions to pass on to the FBI. Her Whitewater adventures began in direct response to Jeff Gerth's March 8, 1992 reporting in the New York Times, which she assumed to be the gospel truth. Her boss told her to check it out. After poring over Madison Guarantee's records for a couple of months, Lewis got all excited. 
Following Girth's lead, she focused on the six months before Arkansas Securities Commissioner Beverly Bassett Schaefer had supposedly acted on Madison's behalf in 1985. Finding evidence of Jim McDougall's fiscal shenanigans everywhere she looked, Lewis jumped to a big conclusion. Everybody in Arkansas who had ever done business with Madison Guarantee was part of a big conspiracy, including the Clintons. She simply assumed that whatever appeared to benefit McDougal also benefited them. No other possibilities appear ever to have crossed her mind. Well, I, I then go on and I describe how she drew up a, a, a criminal referral with the um, FBI, with the Justice Department, just after Bill Clinton's nomination, uh, naming um, the Clintons, uh, Jim Guy Tucker, and Senator J. William Fulbright as uh, suspects. RTC referrals normally took months to process, but Lewis was in a hurry. Within days, she began to pester Little Rock FBI agents with demands for action. When they stopped returning her calls, she left a taunting message with Agent Stephen Irons, receptionist, on September 9th. Have I turned into a local pariah, Lewis asked, just because I wrote one referral with a high profile names? Or do you plan on calling me back before Christmas, Stephen? Five question marks. Irons would later testify that he did so only to tell her tactfully to back off. When Lewis showed up in Iron's Little Rock office on September 18, he told her that due to the referral sensitivity, no action would be taken on it before the election. She warned him that RTC officials in Washington knew of her referral and expected action, which was not true. Much to Lewis's eventual chagrin, Irons took contemporaneous notes. She would later deny under oath having had any such discussions until December 1992. Lewis then began hounding aides to Little Rock U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks, a Reagan appointee who had brought federal bank fraud charges against McDougal two years earlier. Banks, too, would eventually testify to several contacts between Lewis and his office that she had denied under oath. Ironically, Lewis's repeated calls caused others to question her judgment and motives. On October 7, the FBI's Little Rock office sent a teletype to national headquarters pointedly critical of Lewis's referral. It noted that Jim McDougal had been tried and acquitted in 1990 and added that the RTC's, quote, supposition that other persons benefited does not appear to be factually supported by the details that follow. Evidence that the Clintons profited from McDougal's machinations was non-existent. The likelihood that they knew about them was described as highly implausible. The facts, the FBI concluded, indicated that, quote, McDougal was in charge of the Whitewater records and does not suggest that the Clintons had access to checking account statements that would have reflected the questionable transactions at the time. Evidently, Lewis had also submitted as evidence newspaper articles whose contents could not be verified. Okay. On October 16, and this is 1992 now, I want to reemphasize that. It's, it's easy to lose track of when we're talking about. On October 16, U.S. Attorney Banks wrote the FBI formally rejecting Lewis's referral on the same grounds. Quote, while I do not intend to denigrate the work of RTC, Banks added, I must opine that after such a lapse of time, the insistence for urgency in this case appears to suggest an intentional or unintentional attempt to intervene into the political process of the coming presidential election. You and I know, in investigations of this type, and think, listen to how prescient this is, you and I know, in, in investigations of this type, the first steps, such as issuance of grand jury subpoena for records, will lead to media and public inquiries of matters that are subject to absolute privacy. Even media questions about such an investigation in today's political climate all too often publicly purport to legitimize what can't be proven. For me personally to participate, Banks continued, in an investigation that I know will or could easily lead to the above scenario amounts to prosecutorial conduct and violates the most basic fundamental rule of Department of Justice policy. I cannot be party to such actions. Yes. Misconduct. Pros prosecutorial misconduct. Thank you, Diane. My wife is correcting me. <laughs> been doing it for a long time <laughs> she's good at it um, in any case I then I then go on to, to say that Lewis's uh, work had been subjected to withering analysis by uh, a person in the fraud section of the Department of Justice who pointed out that um, the, not only did the facts not support her uh, assumptions but uh, she didn't seem to understand uh, the federal banking laws I mean for example she was trying to say that uh, moving money from one account 
if you had three accounts in the same bank and you move money from one to another, that would be check counting, kiting, which is a federal crime, which of course would make us all guilty all the time. Um, and then uh, Little Rock FBI agents had an even more basic problem with Lewis's efforts. By wasting their time on Madison Guarantee, RTC investigators were overlooking two far more significant Arkansas SNL failures, the $833 million collapse of First Federal Savings and the $650 million nosedive of Savers Savings. The Little Rock office emphasized that both are believed to have much greater prosecutive, prosecutive potential than Madison Guarantee and urged Lewis and her colleagues to get on the stick. Under anything resembling ordinary circumstances, that would have been the end of it. Lewis herself had prepared a 1991 memo listing Madison Guarantee as the 13th most important SNL failure in Arkansas, third from the bottom. <laughs> but for reasons that remain unclear, nobody ever told Lewis that her referral had been found deficient. Imagining the worst, she and her immediate supervisor, Richard Iorio, went on the warpath. On October 6, 1993, Lewis sent a very odd email message to Iorio with copies to two other colleagues. Completely unbidden, she wanted it known, Washington Post reporter Susan Schmidt had shown up on her doorstep. She'd heard Schmidt out, Lewis reported, administered a brisk scolding and sent her away empty-handed. My parting comment, Lewis contended, was, quote, when you contacted me last Thursday, I told you that I had no comment and made every effort to be polite in doing so. What you have done this evening is the most unprecedented breach of professional courtesy I've ever witnessed. So I will say this one more time and one more time only. Do not contact me again at my office or my home. I have no comment on your investigation and will not answer any of your comments. Do not waste any more of my time or yours. The ter formal term for such memos is covering your ass. <laughs> Lewis added that judging from Schmidt's questions, the reporter had by some nefarious means put her hands on a copy of the 92 criminal referral and meant to pursue the story. Uh, Schmidt's article revealing the existence of the RTC criminal referrals involving the President and First Lady appeared on the front page of the Washington Post on October 31. This is October 31, 93. That is a couple of weeks after uh, she turned her fiercely from her door. Um, within a week, RTC officials removed Lewis from the Madison probe and gave her another assignment. She kept working on Madison anyway. By fall 1993, the New York Times' Jeff Gerth was offering Arkansas reporters piles of confidential banking records detailing the dealings of Governor Jim Guy Tucker with Madison Guarantee. The New York Times, he explained, had little interest in so obscure a figure. Gerth never named his source, but he did say that she worked for the RTC regional office in Kansas City. At most law enforcement agencies, passing out confidential financial documents to the press would have constituted a firing offense. But the Kansas City leaker knew the score. Anybody who raised a stink was apt to be charged with a cover-up by the New York Times. Furthermore, whenever the Times and Post cited anonymous sources, anonymous federal investigators as their whitewater sources during the period, it was almost certainly L. Jean Lewis and her pals. <clears throat> then I go on uh, to describe how um, the next February, in February of that month, um, Lewis, having determined that a cover-up was going on because she wasn't getting everything she wanted. I mean, whenever she got what she did want, didn't, whenever what she wanted didn't happen, she immediately concluded there was a cover-up and fired off another uh, criminal referral. So by February of 1994, um, on January 17, 1994, Lewis bought herself a micro cassette tape recorder and a stack of blank tapes. She and Iorio, that's her supervisor, began to take their colleagues aside for little chats about Whitewater. More than one had the uneasy feeling that they were being surreptitiously taped. On February 2, 1994, an attorney named April Breslau visited, the Can visit visited Kansas City from the Washington office of the RTC. Weeks earlier, the Clinton administration had bowed to pressure and agreed to the appointment of Whitewater Independent Counsel Robert Fisk. Gene Lewis's 10 criminal referrals were already in Fisk's hands. Breslau was a career employee who worked for the civil side of the RTC. Her job had nothing to do with criminal prosecution. Her task in Kansas City was to decide whether there was anybody worth suing in the Madison debacle to recover lost money. Jim McDougall, for instance, clearly was not. He had no assets worth pursuing. Was there anybody directly responsible for the SNL's collapse who did? Although she wasn't supposed to be working on Madison anymore, Jean Lewis knew who she thought ought to be sued, Bill and Hillary Clinton. 
So she and Iorio made it a point to get Breslau into Lewis's office. During their talk, she would later testify in excruciating detail, Lewis noticed that an eight-year-old eight tape recorder on her desk had mysteriously switched itself on. It malfunctioned often, she said. Lewis decided not to tell Breslau that the tape recorder was on. Then she steered the conversation around to Whitewater. Lewis told Breslau flatly that she believed Whitewater caused a loss to Madison. She cited a 1985 payment from Whitewater to a firm that had done work for, on a different McDougal property. It struck Lewis as terribly suspicious. It made no sense to me, April, she said. Why would they zap Whitewater $30,000 for an engineering survey in a property that Whitewater had no technical or legal ties to that we could find? A less zealous investigator might have wondered if McDougal had been playing it entirely straight with the Clintons, but no such hypothesis could dent the hard shell of Lewis's zeal. Breslau expressed lawyerly skepticism. It's that kind of crap, she began. I mean, I don't know if it gets us into any of it or not, because obviously this money could go into Whitewater and then come out of Whitewater, so you end up with net at the end is a question mark. I think if they can say it honestly, Breslau continued, the head people, Jack Ryan and Ellen Kulka, RTC officials in Washington, would like to be able to say Whitewater did not cause a loss to Madison. We don't know what independent counsel Fisk is going to find, and we don't offer any opinion on it. But the problem is, nobody's been able to say to Ryan and Kulka, sure, say that. I'm sorry to ask the same questions I'm sure that others have asked. Did Whitewater cause a loss to Madison? How could we get a more definitive answer? In context, any fool can see that Breslau is expressing a bureaucratic truism. Would the RTC prefer not to investigate the President of the United States? Of course it would. Breslau would later testify that she hadn't met Ryan and Kulka at the time her remarks were secretly taped. Lewis herself admitted that she couldn't prove anything either way. If you want me to sit here and give you unequivocal answers as to whether or not Whitewater caused the loss, Lewis con conceded, I can't do it. Now remember this. All I can tell you is that yes, I believe Whitewater caused Madison a loss. Sensing Lewis's drift, Breslau sought to reassure her. They're looking for what they can say, she said, and I do believe they want something honest. But I don't believe at all, and I don't want to suggest at all, that they want us to move to certain conclusions. I really don't get that feeling. But there are answers that they would be happier about because it would get them, you know, off the hook. And that would be it about Whitewater. If only Lewis had the subpoena powers of the FBI, she lamented, she could provide Breslau with that answer. But alas, she did not. Five days later, on February 7, the RTC made the decision to hire the firm of Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro to answer those questions once and for all. To April Breslau's apparent relief, the matter was out of her hands. But her own adventure in Whitewater had not yet begun. A few weeks later, the myth of L. Jean Lewis, GOP Joan of Arc, was born. On March 24, <laughs> 1994, Representative Jim Leach of Iowa took the floor in the U.S. House of Representatives. His announced theme was, quote, the arrogance of power, Machiavellian machinations of, of a single party government. He compared Bill Clinton's Arkansas to Louis Long, Louis Hyong, <laughs> Huey Long's Louisiana. Leach, whom Newsweek described as an Iowa moderate who, moderate who radiates Republican Main Street probity. I love the... I mean, I'm sorry, I don't feel terribly objective myself, but my goodness. Um, d uh, an Iowa moderate who radiates Ma Main Street Republican probity denounced the Clintons for having gone into business with what he called, quote, a budding SNL owner. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? <laughs> How many budding SNL owners do we have out here tonight? Um, he asserted that's one way of getting around the whole problem from the beginning, which is that McDougal didn't get in the SNL business until five years after Whitewater had been bought, by which time it was already defunct. But, so you call him a budding SNL owner, and that takes care of it. He asserted that Jim McDougal had, quote, provided virtually all the money the governor in the making provided his name. Leach asserted that contrary to the Clintons' claims, they had clearly not lost money. Armed with confidential RTC documents slipped to him by Jean Lewis, he affected, like her, to believe that every nickel that passed through the Whitewater account had gone straight into their pockets. Well, then I go on to, to narrate uh, Breslau's reaction when she heard Leach talking about her on the floor of Congress in a tape recording of a conversation that she uh, didn't even recall having, and, and uh, it was a highly inaccurate version. And um, in any case, 
things really got ugly in Kansas City, and by August 1994, uh, the colleagues in Kansas City had compiled a list of grievances against Gene Lewis and Richard Iorio. After a two-week preliminary investigation by employee relation types out of Washington, the matters referred to the RTC's Inspector General. And included among the allegations against Lewis were uh, improper disclosure of confidential documents, uh, secretly tape recording conversations with RTC employees, maintenance of confidential documents at home rendering them inaccessible to RTC staff, frequent use of government equipment for personal gain, um, and against her boss, allowing Lewis to withhold information and documents regarding Madison from RTC lawyers, allowing Lewis to neglect her assignments and continue working on Madison, failure to take action regarding Lewis's leaks of confidential documents, uh, and condoning the secret um, recordings. Now, what happened was that then Kenneth Starr entered the picture at this point, and what he did was he asked the RTC if he could take over the investigation of... Uh, the RTC's investigation of Gene Lewis, which he did, and then he promptly turned it inside out. He dropped the charges against her and began uh, investigating her superiors. At the same time, incidentally, his law firm in Chicago, Kirkland & Ellis, was negotiating a million-dollar settlement with the same RTC officials he had now turned the powers of a federal investigation against. And I'm accused in the New York Times of, of impugning Starr's motives. <laughs> in any case, Next thing you know, Republicans took both sides of Congress in the 1994 elections. It didn't take the Psychic Friends Network to predict that the GOP would do its best to turn C-SPAN into the Whitewater Channel. In late summer of 1995, House and Senate Republicans debuted two new programs more or less simultaneously. Senator Alphonse D'Amato's committee, which would do its best to exploit as much politi political benefit as possible from events surrounding Vince Foster's suicide, and the L. Jean Lewis show, produced and directed by Iowa Representative uh, Jim Leach. Now, um, I want to skip ahead to uh, Lewis's two uh, performances under oath before the respective committees, because it was quite a show. And then, uh, <clears throat> now I just want to give you some idea of. In the meantime, uh, Leach's committee had been getting uh, its information, according to Blood Sport, according to James Stewart's Blood Sport directly from a man named David Bossy, who was the, um, who was a paid operative for an outfit named Citizens United, which is a right-wing um, agit prop, agitation and propaganda organization. That's a Leninist term, but it fits <laughs> here. A group that does opposition research and, and uh, spreads um, what it finds uh, far and wide. My finding is that what they do is they they find everything that they can make look suspicious, throw the exculpatory information in the shredder, and then present it to the press, which in this case gobbled it up like um, chocolate-covered peanuts. But I want to give you some idea of this um, uh, preliminary briefing that will give you an idea, of the, remi remind you of the tone of things in the summer of um, 95 when, this, uh, when these hearings got started. A preliminary briefing handed out to reporters by Leach's House Banking Committee is almost indistinguishable from a Citizens United poster. Its heroine was L. Jean Lewis, who had not only, quote, developed evidence of a massive check-kiting scheme, back to the check-kiting, orchestrated by Jim McDougal, never heard of again, by the way, but who, uh, the briefing predicted, would testify about events that suggest an effort by RTC Washington and highly placed political appointees at the Department of Justice to suppress or at least control her criminal referrals. Besides the First Lady, the Leach briefing figured two other villainesses. One was Beverly Bassett Schaefer, the former Arkansas Securities Commissioner. Quote, Madison needed the state's imprimatur before it could proceed with the issuance of preferred stock, the document explained, <clears throat> though preferred stock had never before been issued by an Arkansas thrift. Mrs. Schaefer approved the plan just weeks after its submission. Well, that's false, but moving along. On a Whitewater's Most Wanted poster distributed about the same time by Citizens United, Bassett Schaefer's character, caricature appeared with the phrase, at large, emblazoned in red. Quote, appointed by Bill Clinton at the urging of Jim McDougal, read the caption, she intervened in Hillary's request to keep the insolvent Madison Guarantee SNL open. The third villainous was April Breslau. Perhaps due to his well-known modesty, Leach didn't see fit to repeat the charges he'd made against Breslau on the floor of Congress more than a year earlier. 
met with RTC criminal investigator Gene Lewis on February 2, 94, the briefing noted. The Citizens United Wanted poster took a more direct approach. RTC flunky, read the legend under Breslau's caricature, allegedly killed Gene Lewis's investigation of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Now remember that it had already gone to the uh, independent counsel by the time that Breslau met Gene Lewis, but anyway. The aim of the House Banking Committee hearings the Leach briefing made clear would be to dramatize the misdeeds of all three women. They would, however, be accused in absentia. No thought seems to have been given to calling the First Lady to testify, and backed by unanimous support of GOP committee members, Leach refused to call Bassett, Schaefer, or Breslau. Democrats pressed, protested in vain. Also missing from the witness list were any and all RTC officials in Kansas City or Washington who had aroused the ire of Gene Lewis nor would the services of the relevant state and federal SNL regulators be required. Nobody from the Arkansas Securities Commissioner, nobody, Commission, nobody from the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, and certainly not Walter Falk, the career uh, <coughs> bank, federal bank regulator who had directly presided over Jim McDougall's ouster for Madison Guarantee in July 1986. Leach's motives can only be guessed at. Events back home in Iowa may have clouded his judgment. In a state where 42 of 46 delegates to the 1992 GOP caucuses had represented Pat Robertson's Christian coalition, he may have begun to see a reputation for moderation as an impediment for greatness, to greatness. <laughs> In any case, what I want to do then is go on to Gene Lewis's uh, uh, appointment, uh, appearance at the hearing. Over the weekend, this is the weekend before the hearing, uh, a dent had appeared in Lewis's armor. Knowing that Democrats were planning to question her motives and competence, the GOP staffers made a tactical leak of several documents late Friday afternoon, August 5. Among them were an October 16 letter from Republican U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks turning down Lewis's first criminal referral on the grounds of weak evidence and partisan intent, internal FBI cables that found Lewis's work wanting, and a February 1993 appraisal by a Justice Department attorney. No facts, it concluded can be identified to support the designation of President Bill Clinton or Hillary Rodham Clinton as material witnesses to the allegations made in the referral. An AP story quoting and summarizing the documents ran in many newspapers over the weekend. The Arkansas Democrat Gazette, among others, played up the story prominently. Here, after all, were three knowledgeable independent appraisals concluding that allegations of criminal wrongdoing by the President of the United States had new, no merit. Most people would call that news. The Washington Post buried the story. The New York Times, however, pitched the documents into a memory hole. Jeff Gerth's August 8th account previewed Lewis's testimony as if the documents simply didn't exist. Mrs. Lewis, he wrote, who was scheduled to testify Tuesday, is prepared to say, quote, I believe there was a concerted effort to obstruct, hamper, and manipulate the results of our investigation of Madison and the subsequent independent counsel investigation by individuals at the RTC, the Treasury Department, the Justice Department, and U.S. Attorney Paula Casey's office in Little Rock. That every professional investigator who examined Gene Lewis's 1992 referral had found it politically motivated and incompetently drawn has never been mentioned in the nation's newspaper of record. During the proceedings on Monday, August 8, moreover, Democrats introduced into the record several documents at odds with Jeff Gerth's own Whitewater reporting, including a December 10, 1987 letter from Beverly Bassett Schaefer almost begging the Federal Home Loan Bank Board to shut Madison Guarantee down. Even more significantly, Utah Representative Bill Orton wrung an admission from a federal bank examiner who had described the chaos he'd found at Madison in 1986 that there had not been a single instance anywhere in the United States of a state chartered, federally insured SNL being shut down by state authorities without the formal cooperation of federal regulators. To my knowledge, this simple fact, which by itself demolishes the fundamental premise of the New York Times version of Whitewater, has never been reported anywhere. Now, by any reasonable standard, Gene Lewis made a terrible witness. In his opening remarks, Representative Leach billed her as the protagonist of, quote, an uplifting and indeed heroic story of middle Americans, public servants and obscure government agencies who refused to be cowed by the power structure. <laughs> Lewis's testimony, on the other hand, made her appear rash, self-righteous, and eager to draw sweeping conclusions from little or no evidence. She wrapped herself in the flag, praising a military upbringing that had taught her tenacity, courage, honesty, and love of country, and that under our Constitution, no one is above the law, no matter how powerful. I mean, I don't, I can't understand how she's not running for office with a self-description <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, 
As predicted, Lewis made sweeping charges of corruption in high places. She had named Beverly Bassett Schaefer in one of her criminal referrals, it seemed, solely on the basis of articles in the New York Times. Within the government itself, anybody and everybody who had ever thwarted her will became ipso facto part of a broad conspiracy to obstruct her probe of Madison guarantee. Asked if she was aware of the felonious overtones of the word obstruction, Lewis replied that she certainly was. When it came to particulars, however, Lewis fared poorly. Pressed by Democrats for the names and titles of any individuals in the Treasury or Justice Departments who had obstructed her probe, she was unable to provide even one. And how long had RTC attorney, attorneys obstructed her probe with their, quote, unprecedented legal review? End quote, seven days. How long had Clinton appointed U.S. Attorney Paula Casey delayed action on Lewis's 92 referral? She'd acted two weeks after taking the oath of office. Lewis's allegations against April Breslau had even less merit. In her prepared testimony, Lewis stated boldly, it is clear that Mrs. Breslau was there to deliver a message that, quote, the people at the top would like to be able to say that Whitewater did not cause a loss to Madison, end quote. Of course, Whitewater did cause a financial loss to Madison, and Madison's failure cost the American people millions of dollars. But Lewis, it turned out, had significantly altered the quote attributed to April Breslau. Or maybe the landmark legal foundation lawyer who had helped her prepare it had done so. Any reporter who examines the text of her surreptitious February 2, 1994 tape recording could see that the sentence, in quotes, simply doesn't appear there. After the tape was played aloud to the committee, Representative Maurice Hinchley of New York confronted Lewis. Breslau's actual words he pointed out were very different from the way Lewis had presented them. The tape also revealed that when Breslau had pressed Lewis for definitive evidence showing that Whitewater had helped sink Madison Guarantee, Lewis admitted that she couldn't provide any. But in Lewis's sworn testimony, she had stated categorically that she could. Had she provided any evidence? She had not. Nor, of course, had the Pillsbury Report, which it turned out Lewis hadn't read. Republicans, for the most part, confined themselves to denunciations of Arkansas rascality, and that's a quote, and praise for Lewis's lonely courage. They compared Democrats who questioned her veracity to cops badgering a rape victim. But reporters for the New York Times and Washington Post owed Jean Lewis and they protected her. No hint of the weaknesses and contradictions in her testimony appeared in either newspaper. The Post coverage was written by Susan Schmidt, the same reporter whom Lewis claimed to have driven empty-handed from her door in October 93. RTC investigator says probe was blocked at high levels, the headline read. Quote, the federal investigator whose work helped launch the independent counsel's ongoing whitewater probe, Schmidt wrote, told a House committee yesterday that there was a concerted effort to obstruct, hamper, and manipulate her findings at high levels of the federal government. Jean Lewis gave a detailed description of how an investigation of Madison Guarantee that began in March 1992 was thwarted by RTC and Justice Department officials after Bill Clinton was elected president. Once again, only Wall Street Journal reporters Vivica Novak and Ellen Joan Pollack covered the story even-handedly. Only the journal conveyed the substance of democratic protests against the committee's refusal to allow the accused to defend themselves and provided context for Lewis's testimony. FBI and Justice Department documents Novak and Pollock wrote contradict Mrs. Lewis's claim that there was an attempt to quash her 92 referral. The article quoted <coughs> U.S. Attorney Charles Banks's letter as well as FBI and Justice Department critiques of Lewis's work. In an article a day later, enough of Breslau's remarks were quoted to convince any sentient adult that all she'd really told Lewis was that her bosses would be relieved to hear that Whitewater hadn't cost the taxpayers any money because it would rid, rid the RTC of a high-profile headache. In a Roundup article, the journal reporters wrote, the star witness RTC investigator Jean Lewis didn't seem wholly credible. Ms. Lewis struck many as ready to draw the most incriminating conclusions from ambiguous circumstances. But as I say, none of that appeared in either the New York Times or Washington Post ever to this date. Now, um, what I'd like to do is, is just do a couple more pages about her Senate hearing and then shut up. This is now, we're now into, um, I believe it's November, yeah, November 29th, 1995. Given her incoherent performance at the House Whitewater hearings, putting Jean Lewis back at the witness table was an act of either pure desperation or sheer folly or would have been if there had been any chance Lewis's reporter pals at the New York Times and Washington Post would fail to cover for her once again, which of course there was not. To anybody familiar with her house testimony, however, Lewis's opening statement on November 29 was a dazzling piece of effrontery. 
Seemingly wrapped with conviction, Lewis told precisely the same tale of heroic perseverance and patriotic grit. Her investigation of Madison Guarantee had been stifled and harassed at every turn. She accused RTC lawyers of obstructing her quest for seven long days. She complained that U.S. Attorney Paula Casey had stalled for two entire weeks, then rejected her 1992 referral, quote, in direct conflict with information I had received from the Justice Department in Washington and the U.S. Attorney's Office, end quote. She charged that April Breslau had come to her office to deliver a message that, quote, the people at the top would like to be able to say Whitewater did not cause a loss to Madison, a quote that Lewis had been caught misrepresenting during her House testimony. Lewis said bluntly that Whitewater had caused the loss to Madison and that the Clintons had profited from it, statements for which she provided no evidence nor ever had. Quote, but if, the Clinton, but if the committee wants to know what the Clintons knew about the corrupt activities resulting in losses to Madison, she ended with a defiant little smirk. Why not invite the Clintons to testify as I am today and have in the past? Why not ask them directly? The Clintons, of course, had already answered writ detailed written interrogatories under oath. The White House had released them to the press back in August. They had also both given sworn testimony to the independent counsel. But who could expect Jean Lewis to know things like that? She evidently didn't read the newspapers, not even new artic art articles about herself. Although, oddly enough, she often cited media accounts as evid evidence against others. She supposedly didn't know, for example, that U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks had turned her 1992 referral down cold. She had no idea that the Justice Department and FBI had exchanged letters and reports debunking her evidence and motives. Months earlier, excerpts had been printed in the Wall Street Journal and other newspapers. When Democrats brought these facts to her attention, Lewis reacted dramatically. But before that happened, Democratic counsel Richard Benvenisti had a few nasty political tricks up his sleeve. First, he confronted her with an FBI agent's contemporaneous, contemporaneous notes to the effect that contrary to her deposition, she'd begun pestering him about her 1992 referral within days of filing it and had made, quote, very dramatic pronouncements about altering history. There was similar testimony from the U.S. Attorney's staff. Evidence showed that Lewis had made a minimum of eight attempts to prod the thing along before the 92 election. In her deposition, she'd sworn she'd made none. Next, Ben Venisti produced an aside from a February 92 personal letter Lewis had written. That is, immediately before she launched her probe of Madison Guarantee. She thought she'd deleted it from a computer disk she'd given the committee, but Democrats retrieved it. A dirty trick? You bet. About on the level of secretly tape recording colleagues, most people would say. In the missive, Lewis had mocked, quote, the illustrious Governor Bill Clinton as a lying bastard who'd put his mistress Jennifer Flowers on the state payroll. Senator Barbara Boxer produced a November 93 letter from Lewis to an attorney in which Lewis had floated a proposal to market presidential bitch t-shirts and coffee mugs mocking Hillary Clinton. She had listed her RTC office as her business phone. Quote, being a woman of basically the same ilk and the same type, Lewis countered, I mean that not as disrespect. I have tremendous res admiration for the fact that she is a strong woman. She added that she personally had absolutely no objection to being called a bitch. <laughs> now, my next sentence originally read, Ben Venisti also questioned the Lewis bitch about her magical tape recorder. <laughs> but again, my editor wouldn't let me have it. So the next sentence reads, <laughs> Ben Venisti also questioned Lewis about her magical tape recorder. He asked whether it wasn't really the truth that she had bought a brand new tape recorder specifically for the purpose of sandbagging April Breslau. I purchased that new recorder well after I had that conversation with Miss Breslau, Lewis answered. As I have previously testified, the old one worked sometimes. It did not work sometimes. It was eight years old. I did not deliberately set out, which I believe is your inference, to tape Miss Breslau. Now, can you imagine if someone in the Clinton administration had testified like that at the hearings? <laughs> but anyway, moving right along. But it wasn't until Democrats laid out documents casting doubt upon her competence and integrity that Lewis lost it. Senator Paul Sarbanes read her attorney Chuck Banks' letter concluding that to act upon her 1992 referral would constitute pr prosecutorial misconduct. No sooner had Sarbanes begun to question Lewis about a negative Justice Department appraisal of her work when an amazing thing happened. Lewis shook visibly, tears welled in her eyes, and she collapsed at the witness table. Although she managed to leave the Senate chamber on her feet, Lewis had to be hospitalized overnight and treated for high blood pressure. She never returned. Her Whitewater adventure was over, and not a moment too soon. By any rational standard, her appearance had been an absolute disaster. <clears throat>
Senate hearing touches on Clinton's integrity, read the headline in the New York Times. A line of inquiry backfires on the Democrats. To Stephen Labaton, the most significant event of the day had been the mention of Jennifer Flowers. As previously, no indications of any weaknesses in either Lewis's work or her testimony were reported. Her presidential bitch proposal merited no mention. Even Lewis's collapse escaped the New York Times notice. Other Democrats, Labaton wrote, looked pained by Mr. Ben Venisti's introduction of the letter and Miss Flowers into the record. Republicans wasted little time in responding, referring to the letter's conclusions regarding Mr. Clinton and Ms. Flowers. Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, for instance, said, Mr. Chairman, what Ms. Lewis said, I'm sure millions of others believe it. I don't have a very good Alabama accent. But... Yes. On December 6th, this is a few days later, on December 6th, the Times delivered yet another stinging Whitewater editorial demanding to know, quote, why Mr. McDougal absorbed a hugely disproportionate share of Whitewater's losses. During recent hearings, the newspaper said, Jean Lewis, a star witness and government investigator into Madison's practices, repeated her charge that there had been a deliberate attempt at both Justice and Treasury to instruct her inquiry. Ms. Lewis said flatly that the Clintons knew about and improperly benefited from M Madison's free ruling practices. Why not come forward with a complete story? I love the New York Times at this point telling me about the complete story. <laughs> The Clintons, it seemed, were, quote, still acting guilty. Also on December 6, Richard Ben Venisti read into the hearings a status report in the matter of Gene Lewis's magical <coughs> tape recorder. Obviously, it was important to us, he said dryly, to learn whether she had purchased the tape recorder prior to the Breslau meeting or, as she had contended, whether she purchased it afterwards. To support her story, Lewis's attorney had sent the committee a receipt dated February 17, 1994, two weeks after the surreptitious recording. A call to her friendly neighborhood office depot outlet, however, had shown that the receipt wasn't for a tape recorder. So yesterday, Ben Venisti said, we issued some subpoenas. And we received from the office depot a receipt which reflects that on January 17, 1994, an Olympus Pearl Quarter model S924 was purchased by Miss Lewis. In fact, Mr. Chairman, the new tape recorder was purchased then in advance of her meeting with Miss Breslau, which would then call into question why, if she had a new tape recorder, would the Breslau conversation be taped by an old recorder? A less lawyerly mind than Ben Venisti's might have concluded that Lewis had fabricated the entire tale. <laughs> the New York Times and the Washington Post, however, didn't think you needed to know. And that's... So that in a nut, I mean, that, that's a very big nutshell, and I, and I apologize, but, but I thought that it was a contained episode that would give you some idea of why a crazy person like myself, who follows, was following this stuff sort of the way I follow the Chicago Cubs, was driven wild. I mean, you'd pick up the newspaper the next day and I'd say, excuse me, the main witness was contradicted by half a dozen FBI agents, was caught in a barefoot lie that nobody would have believed in the first place, and collapsed? And you don't mention it? I mean, just think if Susan Thomas's had collapsed. You know, so I, I just, it, the whole thing has just been a ex most extraordinary experience. And it's also why I tell people that in the final analysis, this book isn't about Bill Clinton and saving Bill Clinton, who certainly doesn't need my salvation. I mean, if he needed me to help him out, he'd be in worse trouble than he's ever been in. But, but, uh, but it's about uh, what I regard as the honor of my profession. Uh, I have seen things uh, done in this whitewater reporting that I never have seen. Uh, this book documents probably a dozen of what I would consider firing offenses if I were the editor of the New York Times, the Washington Post, or any of the, uh, or many other of these media outlets that I've uh, scrutinized. And it doesn't. It not only appears that people haven't been damaged. It appears that the more they screw up, the better they do, and uh, the more they. Uh, file one-sided, partial, blatantly uh, prosecutorial accounts, the better they do. Um, I know, for example, just from my own experience, I learned a lot of what I know about being a journalist and reporter working for um, Bill Broyles and Greg Curtis at Texas Monthly in Austin, where I did a whole lot of work in the mid-70s through the early 80s. And I can tell you, without telling any tales out of school, I can tell you that if I had ever done to 
any source what Jeff Girth did to Beverly Bassett Schaefer. Uh, that is taken 20 pages of memos from her, talked to her for hours and hours, and then um, portrayed her as forgetful and suspiciously so in the stories. Um, I would have been called into the office and somebody would have laid those things on the table and said, did you get these? Did you see these? Is this accurately represented to me that you were given these memos? Yes, sir. And you wrote that she forgot everything about it? Clean your desk. I don't think I'd have, I mean, I don't think, I, I might not have been able to take my car out of the parking garage after that was over. And I don't understand how people get away with this sort of thing, and, well, and I don't think they should. And that's all. Pardon? Aren't we playing out public dramas here? The longer they uh, build this thing up, uh, the, long, the more the drama goes on. Now the big one, it seems to me, is let's get Hillary. You know, they keep on, uh, that'd be exciting. We've never had a first lady indicted. Yeah, there is an element of drama to it, and I think that's something the press doesn't often like to acknowledge, that, 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 <laughs> that it has, that, and this is something that's, I think, very important in the way the White House is being covered. And it's not just for Bill Clinton, either. This is here forever now. It's partly because Bill Clinton's from a little obscure state that nobody knows anything about. They can, you know, you can say that anything happened here and people will believe it. I swear if they said there are sea serpents in the Arkansas River, <laughs> uh, mutant sea serpents that were put there by a bizarre genetic experiment involving incest in some way, <laughs> and, and, and that they were put there un, and Bill Clinton failed to do anything about it, by God, it, it would make the front pages of some of the nation's newspapers. It, they, Capitol Hotel would be full for a week. <laughs> but but it, it's partly that, but it's partly also what's happened in journalism is that the president is the number one celebrity, and he, he's even more important than Tom Cruise and Clint Eastwood. And, and there's a horde of people out there who aren't don't know what a savings and loan is and don't know what the Treasury Department is, and, or even that there is a Justice Department, but they do want to know who's sleeping with Hillary. And, and, um, and so that aspect with, with the increased pressure from a 24-hour day news cycle, uh, the pressure of talk radio, the tremendous pressure from tabloid journalism, and the leakage as, as newspapers have a declining share, the respectable papers have a slowly declining share of the market, the temptation to go ahead, grab it, and throw it into the New York Times or the Washington Post because it's already on Rush Limbaugh it's already on uh, talk radio, it's already on tabloid TV, is growing. And it's going it, to, I've said this before, this is a two-headed snake. To me, this is not about supporting, um, it's not about supporting Clinton. It's about, what, can we get a handle on this before it destroys us? That's my fear. Yes? In a column, you recommended that people read James Fallow's book, Breaking the News. Yes. I followed that recommendation. Yeah. It's a hard read. But it deeply concerns me about the change in uh, reporting. And I wonder what your view is on whether New York Times against Sullivan has had uh, an effect upon uh, accountability. Yeah, that's an aspect. I'm glad you asked that question because that's another aspect I meant to mention. As the, pre as the nation's prime celebrity and, and most public possible figures, by definition, the president and his wife are almost completely libel proof. That is... I know that, that, that by, because I've done it, published that Simon & Schuster does not fact check books in the way that, say, Harper's Magazine does, in the way this book was fact checked. They sent a young woman down here who made my life, if she hadn't been such a pleasant person, my life would have been miserable for four or five days. She made me prove everything. I mean, everything. I mean, they, she called me up and said, you've said here that Arkadelphia is about 30 miles from Hot Springs and it looks more like 50 to me. <laughs> And we got out the road map, and I said, you know, it's, you're, you're closer to right than I am because I was measuring from one of those little towns, Friendship or somewhere. <laughs> I'd just taken the wrong, I don't know if I, I might not have my glasses on when I started counting the little numbers on the road map. <laughs> um, but but books, books are not fact-checked at all, except by libel lawyers. And so when you have... And, and my, when I wrote Widow's Web, we went at it for weeks. We pared it down from an 80-page list to a three-page list and out with me proving things, changing wording. Uh, but if you're writing about the president, that's not really necessary because it's a waste of time and money because, by definition, the president can't sue. 
And so the, the kind of skeptical going over, and, and isn't going to sue anyway, because then you, 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 you hire, Simon & Schuster hires uh, lawyers and subpoenas every piece of paper he's got, and you know, his life is hell from then on. So you're not, if you're the president, you're not gonna sue. So I'm, I'm sure the books are not getting that kind of going over. The fact that a public figure like the president can't sue is of enormous importance. You can say almost anything, allege almost anything to be true, and there's really not, there's hardly anything they can do. And I, as I, I'm sure you have your reasons for asking that question. <laughs> but, well, I, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I mean, it, it, any public <laughs> figure has to now live in fear. Any public figure has to live in fear. The question really has to do with accountability right. of the press. The required, uh, honest reporting was once uh, a matter of concern. Right. And, well, Jim Fallows and I were colleagues at Texas Monthly in the period I talked about. As a matter of fact, he, uh, I'm a better tennis player than he is. He just beat me two out of three times <laughs> over a period of a year. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I... Account, it seems to me and it seems to Jim, who I've talked about since he wrote his book, and I, I recommend his book very highly. And when you say it's a hard read, it's not a difficult read. It's just hard to take. It's hard to absorb. The press is now the single most powerful, totally unaccountable institution in our society. And the only way it can have any accountability to me is we don't want the government doing it and we don't want outside agencies doing it, is for people to do things like what I'm doing. But Man, you want to talk about some crybabies. Oh, these people who make a career out of impugning the ethics and ruining the careers of a dozen people at a time, you just suggest that maybe they knew something and left it out, and they whine and cry and carry on. Oh, it's just unbelievable. And none of, they won't do it on the record, though, I might add. Yes? I wanted to ask you about Mr. Leach. Uh, he, he has had a reputation of being a responsible reasonable, conservative person. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you know anything about his staff? Because obviously these people well, I depend think the best, to a great deal on their staff. The best place to read about that is in actually uh, Bloodsport, I've been told, is pretty good on the Washington side. It, it's unbelievable about Arkansas and, and, the, and the Whitewater deal itself, everything that can be twisted or turned. But uh, there, he's quite a good passage on that. Yeah, his staff was taking handouts directly from Citizens United that whole time. It was straight pipe right from, right from this David Bossy guy um, and um, Floyd Brown. These are the people that did the Willie Horton ad. That's the way everyone always IDs them. It's not by any means the worst thing they've ever done, I don't think. But, but it was just a straight pipeline. It was going straight through. And that's why I wanted to highlight that stuff from the preliminary briefing. I mean, they were saying things that... <laughs> Any skeptical reporter uh, would say, well, gee, that's not quite right, or that's not really true. Um, but, and it was going straight to Leach, and I don't, I don't know what to what degree people are creatures of their own staff, but it seems to me at some point a, 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 a person like Leach has to say, wait a minute. Um, you guys told me that this witness was going to say this, this, and this. They didn't. Don't do this to me again. <laughs> you know. And that, I, I don't know whether that's happened or not. He's been pretty quiet since last summer on this, you know. Well, you know, Kenneth Starr got behind the Paula Jones story. Or ne it never would have gotten off of the... Well, I know he, he offered to write a brief... Huh? And he offered to write a brief uh, on, the, on the idea that the president should be suable. I know that, yeah. But I don't know that he had any other... Why does he keep pushing it? He wants it to get in there before... Well, I don't think he's had anything to do with it since he's been in the independent counsel's office. Well, but he, I, I think he was willing to write a brief on the, on the argument that I the president should the be. I still see the paper. I thought he did write a brief, an amicus brief. He may he have did. written one. He may have written one. He, I know he offered to. I, I'm not certain about Maybe that. Maybe not. Sam? Prove he did. I think I may have found your thesis sentence, Gene, on page 27. I didn't know so, I had one. I think I, think I found it. <laughs> Celebrity <laughs> Trump's accuracy in political journalism almost every time. I want to ask you about your use of the Celebrity word Celebrity Trump? Trump? Celebrity, Celebrity Trump's, Trump's accuracy, accuracy yeah. in political oh, yeah. journalism almost every time. Right. Why did you use the word almost? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think you, I mean, I, I, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe. maybe <laughs> thank you. <laughs> maybe I should have scored it out. But I mean, that's what happens. The, 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 what I was pointing out is that the status and, and to some degree the effrontery of the journalist making the accusation. And this is particularly true also in a time when one of the things that Jim Fallows talks about in his book is how um, 
it's possible now, if you can get on these shout shows and become a, a, a Washington celebrity, to make almost as much money as a good bullpen catcher. So, you know, I mean, you, you can make mo as much money as a no-hit third baseman, you know, if you can get to be a high-tone uh, celebrity. So there's a lot of competition to display your effrontery and to say, uh, as I say, they're both more or l and sometimes less than you know. Yeah. yeah. Slant that the press in general gives the news. We read about them being 91 percent liberal, or uh, and, and Rush Limbaugh and his people are keep talking about the liberal press. And I have a hard time finding the liberal press. Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, you'd have a hard time here. You'd surely have a hard time here in Arkansas um, with the liberal press finding the liberal press. But. Um, I don't know. I mean, th I, those discussions don't mean a great deal to me. In, in, this, in this story, uh, it seems to me that, that the press's main uh, value is a kind of snide aggressiveness and self-aggrandizement about public figures now, and that left, right, it, it doesn't really make that much difference. I mean, people are built up or torn down depending on the needs of the moment. I mean, when, 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 when Newsweek describes Leach as a figure of Main Street probity, they mean let me, let me just say this in a smart alecky way. Um, that's always my preference. Um, they mean he's not re he's not really he's not what he appears to be, but he plays one on TV. I mean that's really kind of what they're saying. It, it meets the need of the moment, is what I'm saying. I, I don't think that the press has um, uh, really much ideology as such anymore, uh, and certainly the whole. Sp spectrum has shifted so the, what, what I mean you know depends on who's talking yes I have, well, I'm really like very angry about this and I'm glad you're writing about it because I think we're, if we're an Arkansan you're a victim I am like you I, I was a Yankee that came down here kicking and screaming because I believed all the hundred years of bad press that Arkansas had then I thought oh Clinton's elected you know it'll get better we had the brain drain where they took the best of the brightest to Washington and they're either committed suicide or indicted or right, shaved right. or something. Yeah. How long is it going to take Arkansas to get over the last PR hit? And how much of a political hit do you think we have? I mean, we have lost the governor we voted for, who I thought was doing a reasonable job. And, and, and we have a, a governor in less than three weeks. I understand there's a rumor that we may lose half our Medicare and He's pro-life, but he's pro-execution. Yeah, I don't know what he's. Are we going to take a political hit? And how long is it going to take us to get over this PR nightmare? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I tend to see. I tend to see these kind of things as kind of epiphenomena in the history of the state. And I think that, I think that Arkansas people spend a lot more time worrying about their image than they need to. I mean, even though I've done it, I mean, I, I don't really. I really don't. I really don't think it's any it's going to have any lasting impact on on the on on our lives in the state. But it's just not going to ruin anything. I mean, they can do this. They can ruin people. They can sway elections. There is some morality but, but people, here that's gone astray. But people people are smarter than you think. I mean, I think that you know, if look, if the American people aren't if the American people are good at nothing else, they're good at watching cop shows. <laughs> and, and, and what they've, no, this is true, I learned this, I, when I wrote my last book, Widow's Web, which was about Tommy Robinson's great investigation, um, one of the cops told me, it may have been, it may have been Judge Chris Piazza, or, or one of the homicide cops in Little Rock, I can't remember who told me this, but he said, you know, a real investigation, Gene, starts with a bunch of suspects and a broad spectrum of evidence, and it gets narrower as it goes on. You eliminate suspects, and you throw aside the nonsense, and you get to the heart of the matter. Uh, a Tommy Robinson investigation starts wide and goes wider, <laughs> and 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 what that's been Whitewater, and and people have sort of in their funny way they don't know the details they can't argue it they think well I don't know about those billing records, but they're waiting because they don't see any concrete charges. If when I'm on these talk shows and and I get a hostile caller I just said, well why don't you tell me what crime they committed? What 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 is the crime here? You tell me what it is they've done, and and that's when the sputtering starts, and the, you know, and you, you know, it's not very difficult. So uh, people are confused, but they, I think a lot of people have seen through this thing, which is why, the press keeps gnashing its teeth and saying, as if it's some kind of civic shame that the people don't care about Whitewater. I don't think the people know the details, but I think they've correctly gathered that 
that there's a great there's a lot of just because there's a lot of dust and feathers doesn't mean there's a chicken you know and I think that's what they've um, concluded and I think they're waiting uh, to see because time after time you couldn't you couldn't if you followed it at all you couldn't help but notice next week's testimony will reveal and then it would come and go and then it would be next week's testimony and the press never failed uh, to jump on each new accusation, but I think the public wearied of it. And my best example of that was uh, right after uh, Tucker and McDougal were convicted. I was listening on KLR and uh, KARN on the radio to a detailed recounting of each of the charges. They were running down each of the 18 counts that McDougal was convicted on and telling the fate of the thing. Uh, but they weren't even done yet before I had CNN on at the same time in my office. This is how nuts I got on this subject. Uh, and, and CNN already had a talking head on there saying, um, this shows that the jury believed the embezzler David Hale and they did not believe President Clinton. This is the beginning of the end for the White House. That was at 5 p.m. that afternoon. By 8 p.m. that evening, the jurors had been interviewed and they said, oh no, we didn't believe anything Hale said. We went strictly on the documentary evidence. We believed what the president said. It just didn't have anything to do with the charges. Okay. So uh, people, I think ordinary people notice that kind of thing. <laughs> and, and, it, and it gradually adds up on them. What effect do you think Joe Klein's uh, shenanigans uh, lately has had on this credibility? Well, I think it's, I've, I've written about this actually. I think it's another example of Bill Clinton being the luckiest politician in the world. I mean, just when the press is building up this foaming frenzy about him, you have this Aldrich book, and then you have the, um, and then you have the, the Joe Klein thing coming out, in which supposedly everybody's running out to buy this book because it's the inside scoop, and then you find out it's by a guy that Bill Clinton wouldn't trust to take his shirts to the laundry, and you know that it's just, you know, you know, and why did the press love it? Well, why does a monkey like to look in a mirror? You know, so. Um, So I don't, I mean, I don't know, everybody, a lot of people got high and mighty. I don't think that uh, a, a journalist, I don't think journalists should ever lie in public. Um, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think it should be done. And I think it's, and I, and I think that Klein is, is probably tarred by that now for a long time, but his celebrity now will go on, except now he'll have to write in his own name and nobody will buy the book. Uh, David, am I right about this? I, I came up here after I wrote a column about how Klein had done it, didn't, sales of primary colors in this bookstore fall off sharply after it was known that Klein had... Yes. Yeah. Because people were buying it because they thought it was inside gossip, and when they found out it was just from a reporter... And you know how much... I mean, I only know one personal thing about Hillary, and that is that she'd climb a tree before she'd spend five minutes in his company. And, and I don't know personally about him. I know about any reporter, <laughs> including myself, I'm sure. So, um, you know, I, it, it just it lost credibility completely. Four or five years ago, was, uh, is, is anybody else? Uh, have a, yes, yes. One of my biggest concerns about what the press is doing in this type of thing is that almost everybody has some type of skeleton in their closet. Are we going to be able to get qualified, good people to run for office, <coughs> to serve in cabinet positions, if the press is going to be digging in and digging back right. and digging well, back? You want my cynical answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Only if, like George Bush, the press is socially intimidated by their wealth and their family connections and their school ties. But a person whom the press can safely condescend to and won't be embarrassed, can't be turned away by the butler, they're going to go after from now on. I think, I think we're in the pattern now. Unless, unless and until people just, you know, I, I really think people have to get hurt. People in the press have to get hurt. The only way that this kind of irresponsibility and one-sided reporting stops as if people get hurt for it. And the only way I know to hurt people for it the way we are now is to expose them. Okay, does anybody sue people for libel anymore? Well, no, no, not. that's what that's, that's what the question earlier, if you're a public figure, it, it, you can't sue for libel. It's almost impossible to, rent, to win. You have to prove so that was wrong. You have to prove that actual malice uh, you have to prove reckless order. indifference to whether or not it was wrong, and then you have to prove actual financial damages. Time you get done with that list, it's got to be something like uh, uh, Carol Burnett sued the National Enquirer for something outrageous. But for something like this, they accused her of being drunk uh, at some yeah. party. Yeah, but for a politician, the, the the process of going through the trial with the discovery and the 
but can anybody say there were quarters? No. Don't you Why? think we're going to have to do something, though? Well, the same there's, reason. There's the an same. entertainment aspect here that's gotten out of hand, mm -hmm. and I believe we're going to have to yeah. punish people when they do this sort of thing on purpose. Awesome. you got to punish them. And I don't know how you punish them, but <laughs> your well, way is one way. But well, the only way, the only way is expired. I mean, I, did, I don't, I, I mean, I, I would say there were two reasons why I didn't do things like this as a journalist. One was I feared exposure. I mean, one, I mean, some of it is, in, you know, I, I don't think I would, but, but if I were tempted, I would fear to be caught, and I would surely fear to be fired and ruined. But if there are, so if there are no consequences. Well, but people, editors, fear to be sued at one mm -hmm. time, but now we've taken that away. That's what I'm saying. You've right. got to return punishment for these people that have carte blanche. And I put you in that. Right. In, uh, right. Well, that I, I think we need. I think, I think we need we fair and vigor. I think we need fair and vigorous commentary. But I, I don't know. I don't know how you force papers to be at least minimally fair. I mean, to me, when a when a when a witness is touted as the star witness after she's been contradicted by several FBI agents, U.S. attorneys, when she can't prove anything, when she makes patently absurd claims and gets caught in a lie and then faints and they don't report that, what are they going to report? And the crazy thing to me is it was, I saw it on C-SPAN. I'm going, look at this, this is incredible. Well, you know. In this, in this issue, pardon me, in pardon? this issue of the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, you need to stop I reading that thing. <laughs> <laughs> the editorial, it's a great newspaper, but the editorial the pages. It's all over again. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you know who reads the, re make, writes the review and outlook? Th that's the, that, that's uh, Robert Bartley may not write them all, but he's the editorial page editor, and he's so mm -hmm. crazy on the subject of Bill Clinton that Paul Greenberg thinks he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> No, he does. He does. I quoted him in the. I've quoted him in the book talking about how just mention Clinton or Ar Arkansas well, I, to. That's the reason I wanted to know the name of who wrote that. I mean, the, he's just talking about character. There, there's, there's, about character there, there's no accuracy and no accountability on the Wall Street Journal editorial and page. Over here, I know Otherwise, it's the best paper in the country, but <laughs> not the editorial page. Uh, they've got, uh, they have this thing here on Hillary. Uh, <laughs> let's see it. August the 16th, we will renew his call for White House officials to be held in contempt of Congress. That is William Klinger. On, uh, oh, well, he's, they're going to play that out. It's impossible to be in contempt. The, the, on the Travelgate thing, my only notion is, I, one of the things I do in, this, in the book is I have a very brief section on Travelgate, and I don't defend what happened at all. All I do is point out that... Um, the accusations that are being made of what Mrs. Clinton said or what she didn't say, all the uh, stuff that's being treated as news was two years old a year ago when I wrote it. It all, it all comes straight out of government documents, a GAO report, OPR, Office of Professional Responsibility reports. Uh, I noticed it was, I think it was yesterday, they trotted it out again for the third time. The same accusations, which are now three years old, uh, and are treated as news all over. It's almost as if we have a whole new generation of reporters. Well, I noticed they're going to talk about going over the foster yeah. thing again here. Oh. Well, that'll continue forever. We probably need to wrap this up. Maybe I ought to take one more question before people just yeah. start pelting me with paperbacks. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, the gentleman up front was talking about uh, what punishment there could be or what kind of uh, hurt, pain that the people could be aware of. My feeling is on that that it, you know, an editor fears a flop. If people weren't buying the type of books or the papers just for the thrill of reading the sensationalism, then there would be no payback. And if there's no payback, right. well, they're not going to do it. Well, human nature is going to improve. That's that. That's <laughs> that's the problem. But what, what, but what I think, what I'm arguing against is the very thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because I'm not going to whine. But the New York Times assigned my book for review to a former reporter from the Washington Bureau, i.e. to the pals of the people, to a pal of the people I'm criticizing. And he called it nasty and a smear job and basically said it's an ugly thing to do to criticize other journalists. <laughs> I mean, I don't know any adult profession in the United States of America which has no form of accountability or peer review except the press. And it's the only one that doesn't. And now they're saying even criticizing them. I mean, it's not like I have the power to yank their licenses or call them before the Arkansas Licensing Commission so that they can't sit in the Capitol Hotel bar anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, hey, you guys got this upside down and backwards and you don't seem to care.
and gee, after a while, you start to wonder whether you didn't do it on purpose. So, but, but it seems to me that's the only, the only thing, the only, it's like what people in the ACLU say about censorship. I'm not advocating censorship. The only answer to bad speech is more speech. The only answer to bad journalism, it seems to me, it, in the present instance, is good journalism. Because I don't want the press regulated and I don't want, you know, I, I can't think how that would be done. But, but Times versus Sullivan w w removed all fear. That's no restraint. It, it removed all financial fear of attacking politicians from journalists. One more, Chris. I know, because I know it'll be a great question. Well, I've, what, what incentive do, do journalists have? I mean, if you want to distinguish uh, Watergate that Judge Thornton was mentioning and the current one, people forget that Woodward and Bernstein never printed anything that did not have three independent sources, yeah. which is what Brad, Ben Bradley insisted on. Mm -hmm. What incentive do they have to do it the hard way with, with C-SPAN and, and talk radio, what credit do they uh, get for doing it? I can tell you one thing, nobody's getting rich on C-SPAN, but, yeah. but, but that is, but on the other hand, that is where you can make a name for yourself of some kind. Um, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me only by, um, only by, basically the only tool I know right now is public ridicule, and that's the one I'm trying to use, and, and the, the odds are I'm going to get crushed by this myself, so, you know. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I got, I got two calls one day about two weeks ago from two friends, one in Louisiana, one in uh, Wisconsin, who are both Republican Clinton haters saying they were so ashamed of what uh, this was the week of the Aldrich vote, that they were so ashamed of what the Republicans were doing, they were going to vote for them. I don't think they will, but they talked about it. Well, I hope they did. Well, it, it was not even a discussable subject. Right. How can I... Uh, uh, say, uh, H O D G E S. No. Yes. Well, the big problem is going to be getting this book publicized at all outside. Uh, yes. Outside Arkansas, a small place. Yes, exactly right. We've got a dandy. This is the Bob Fisher I know. there.
worked out right. Or is that you? Yeah, yeah I can read it. I know who it is. You know who you are? Yes. Well, that's a big advantage in this world. Most, most days I know who I am. I'm waiting for my wife to come in and see if she still knows who I am since I'm wearing my Buffalo Grill shirt. Right, well, you're selling me some mini books. Bye bye. Bye bye, Ben. Nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Just plain stuff. Yeah.
right. Get, get my heart beat. Good. Oh, would you rather I some No, I'll die. I'll die. I'll die. Um, I'm honored that you would think that well of me. But we well, got you know I do. Fire this, I don't know if this will raise your blood pressure. But it, but it helped me control mine because it's... I tried to have as much fun with it as I could. It's the only white water book you'll ever read that has jokes in it. <laughs> True. See you. See you later. We're not even here. How are you? Yeah, sure. How's Diane? She's good. She ought to be here one of these times. I mean, she's good when I see her. She gets me in my Buffalo Grill t-shirt. That'll be trouble. This man's Well, it's somebody Diane's known for a million years. I'm so proud somebody said that was Thank you. Pardon? I'm so proud you said that was Well, I've had fun doing it. It is, uh, it has been entertaining. I've played several years. I've played in just two words. Okay. I told her I was going to send her the truth, so just put the truth. That's my sister-in-law. We just got back from our family reunion. We had a nice political discussion. Oh, one of those. Huh? <laughs> well, it is amazing. I mean, I just don't understand how people can be expected to make decisions with the quality of information. <laughs> I agree. And the erroneous information. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Please to meet you, Hi. Mr. Lance. Nice to meet you. Could you put uh, two bill on this, please? I sure will. real big because I don't have my glasses on. I can't see without them. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sure, if that's what you want. Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> well, how does he spell his last name or do you want to do that? Well, yeah. Just put K-I-N-N. A-R-D? A-R-D. Is it's hard to make somebody mad by giving them a book because if they don't like it, they just don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we, we like you. So we well, thank you very much. To the two of us. Betty and I. Betty and Ila. I L A. B E T T Y? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a book I want you to write. You remember reading about the Princess Irene Barnes that used to live here? I know Irene. Knew Did Irene you know? very well, yes. Oh, that story was just fascinating to me. Yeah. Life. And I said, oh, I'm going to go out and that's something that Jean and I was going to Yeah, that was very sad. I mean, there was, there were, we knew a lot of people that tried to do something for her toward uh -huh. the end, but, but there, wasn't be any, there wasn't anybody you could. Uh -huh. The law makes it so difficult. I mean, oh, yeah, what, what right. needed to happen was somebody to have her committed. And, uh -huh. This is for Mary Pate. Okay. P-A-T-E? Uh-huh. Mary lives in Birmingham. About Books airs every Saturday and Sunday on C-SPAN 2. Saturdays beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. Sunday nights at 9 Eastern and Pacific. Next Saturday, part two of Goucher College's conference on creative nonfiction. 